Good to see everybody again tonight. Thank you again for uh, your hospitality this weekend. And so great to get to meet many of you uh, last night and then this morning. And I'm uh, looking forward to connecting again shortly tonight um, after our time here together and then tomorrow morning as well. Real honor, real privilege. Not everybody in Ontario is Irish. My wife is Scottish, okay, you so know. And, uh, and yeah, on my mom's side of the family, they're all British. So it's, uh, it's a real, real United Nations. But anyway, <laughs> great to be here, and I think I mentioned last night, it's my first trip to Manitoba, and uh, loving it, your winter is coming here a little sooner than in Ontario, uh, we still got leaves on the trees uh, back home, they're coming down, but uh, we are bracing ourselves for the snow, you didn't have to go to all that trouble to put the snow out for us, just saying, but uh, very kind nonetheless, although I think tomorrow's going to be uh, fairly mild as well, and what will it matter if the Blue Bombers win, right? <laughs> <laughs> The Argos lost today, so I'm I'm, I'm uh, choosing not to think about football here <laughs> anymore tonight. January 12th, 2010, just before 5 p.m. in the impoverished country of Haiti, they were rocked with a massive, devastating earthquake. And many of you will remember that. The news stories, the uh, images, the footage that came out of the country, heartbreaking, devastating, the countless buildings collapsing, killing thousands upon thousands of people. I have uh, I visited the country of Haiti many times, uh, several times, and I have talked to many people about their experience and memories of the earthquake doctor survivors. And uh, what you hear again and again is about just how widespread the destruction Everybody, everybody knows somebody who was killed. And uh, I remember talking to a friend of mine, he was telling me that when the quake hit, he and his wife were in their home sitting across the table from each other, and they said things began to shake so violently that they said they reached out across the table and it was all they could do just to hold on to each other as the world shook around them. Now, given the, how violent the earthquake was, it, it is not a surprise that many buildings were damaged and destroyed. But the destruction, though, was just, just so extensive. And as I talk to people and try to understand the, the scope of it and, and how, how the destruction was so widespread, what was explained to me is, is as follows. That, yes, an earthquake of that magnitude would certainly cause a lot of damage, but in a country like Haiti, where the poverty is so extreme, uh, it affects everything, including construction. And so, in order to make the cement go a little bit further, as blocks were made in the country, they are often diluted, so just get a little bit further. So they're strong enough to build with, but not strong enough to stand in the face of an intense earthquake. And that, that's a big reason why there is just so many collapsed buildings. And, and even in the days that follow, this fine white dust everywhere, blowing around everywhere. It was in everything. It was all from the dust of the cement blocks. So heartbreaking. So tragic. But I thought about that in relation to our topic tonight. I thought there is, in the midst of, you know, such a, heart, a heartbreaking memory, there is a lesson in that for us. There were buildings that had the appearance of strength, but actually were weak. And there's an instructive element to that, that we, we don't want to just have an appearance of strength as the followers of Jesus Christ. We don't want to just have a, a look of godliness about us, but to be God and to be strong, to be firm in the faith and strong in the Lord. We don't want just people to talk about, we don't want people to just talk about these things, but who walk in them and who are strong to the end through many of life's trials and difficulties and struggles. And when we think about the things that will make us strong as Christians, as a local church, it's vital that we, we lay hold of and apply the things that God has given us to make us strong. I mean, I, I certainly a clear commitment to the authority and the sufficiency of Scripture. And I love, I love that this church is all in on that. So vital. An unshakable fidelity to the truth of the gospel. The centrality of preaching the gospel in your church ministry and in your life. Uh, a passion for the person of Jesus Christ and unashamed adoration of Him and who He is and the, the treasuring of Christ in your life. All these things are so vital for us to be strong in the faith and certainly also a priority for prayer. 
And this is one reason I'm so blessed by the theme of this weekend, and even your presence here, you know, last night and this morning and tonight and again, uh, talking about something that for, for many, many of us struggle with it, and for, and for, for some, you hear the, the, the title of, you know, prayer is the focus for the weekend, and, and, and the reality is, honestly, lots of people don't get too excited about that. But it's massively important. If we're going to make it, if we are going to make it, we have to be men and women of prayer. If we are not praying, we're done. We're done. And that really is at the heart of what we're looking at here tonight. Standing strong in prayer, without it, we're dead. We, we so, so desperately need this. And it's, I'm blessed by this theme of the conference, and I, I think it's one of the reasons why Paul, when he was teaching on the subject of spiritual warfare, prayer figured prominently. In fact, it's really kind of the climactic as Paul gave that, that well-known uh, teaching on spiritual warfare in Ephesians 6, the, the climax of that teaching really lands on, culminates with prayer and the priority of prayer in our lives. And, and he shows us in that text not only about the priority of prayer, but there's a kind of praying, or you could say a quality of praying, that's crucial if we are going to stand strong. And that's what I want to spend a few moments with on tonight with you from Ephesians chapter 6. If you would turn from there to Ephesians chapter 6, and uh, I'm going to read from verses 10 through to 20. Ephesians 6, 10 to 20. We're going to focus, though, for our teaching on verses 18 to 20. So I'll read from 10 to 20. We'll focus on 18 uh, to 20. Again, well-known text here for the Apostle Paul uh, on the armor of God. And what you see when you begin in the context in verse 10, the emphasis, the, the thrust, the, the aim of this text is that believers would stand strong in the Lord. You know, the enemy works overtime to get you to fall. And your, your flesh is, is, is does, our flesh does not help us either, right? We, so we, we feel, we come into this thing with a sense of, of weakness. But wonderfully, the Lord is strong. And so we're called here to a great strength, a strength that's not in and of ourselves, but of the Lord. But we must lay hold of this strength. Look what Paul says in verse 10. Finally, be strong in the Lord. Be strong. So not strong in yourself. Not strong in your own thinking. Not, not, but strong in the Lord. Outside of it, there is a strength, there is power that we need that's vital for us. That comes from outside of us, from the Lord. Be strong in the Lord and in the strength of His might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. Now that, there should be warning bells going out. We read this, like the, so the devil is scheming against me. Yes, he is. He's scheming against you. You maybe get those phone calls like I do, right? These Who's this unknown number calling? And somebody's trying to call to get me to buy something or hand over my credit card number or my social insurance number or something like that. Right? They're scheming to, to trick me and then to get me to fall into this trap. Well, the devil's scheming. And, and he, he doesn't call you on the phone, but he's all, we're, we're all around. And Paul says here, we need strength from God to stand. And wonderfully, God supplies us the resources we need to stand. It's wonderful. He reminds us, verse 12, we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness. See, it's a spiritual battle. Against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all to stand firm. See, see the, the, the emphasis here is on standing strong. Not caving into sin, not falling away from the Lord, but, but pressing on in strength, strength that God supplies. Okay, well, what's this armor then? What, what are these resources? Well, he, he unpacks them, starting in verse 14. Stand, therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth, and having put on the breastplate of righteousness. So, so truth is essential. The, the righteousness, as I understand it, the righteousness that we have in Jesus and walking in righteousness. As, and as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace, in all circumstances, 
take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish the flaming darts of the evil one. Think about it. Like Paul is just like, the devil, he so hates you. And there are flaming arrows coming at you all the time. He says, take the helmet of salvation. So we need, we need to trust the Lord. We need faith and, and to be, be putting our trust in him, in God, believing on him. The helmet of salvation, he said. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. So he lists up all these resources, and you could, you could do a great sermon series, right, on all these things, and maybe you have them, perhaps you will. But we come down to verse 18 in the theme of our weekend of prayer, and notice what Paul says, praying at all times of the Spirit. So all these resources, we need to lay hold of these things, and understand them, and take them seriously. But now here, this culminating point, verse 18, prayer. Praying at all times in the Spirit, with all prayer and supplication, to that end keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints, and also for me, that words may be given to me, and opening my mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains, that I may declare boldly as I ought to speak. Here's the main point for tonight. It's this, this one main point, and then we'll unpack it. Standing strong requires prayer. Standing strong requires, we say, well, Ross, there's a whole bunch of things here. Yep, all those things, but also prayer. Standing strong requires prayer. It isn't the only thing, but it is vital. And without it, we are building lives with, out of blocks of diluted cement. I'm very interested in Mark 9 and 29. Mark 9 and 29, Jesus' disciples had tried to cast out demons and couldn't. And Jesus said this, This kind cannot be driven out by anything but prayer. It's fascinating. It's fascinating to me because it reminds me that there are some things that only God can do. There's some things that only God can do. And when you think about some of the battles, some of the strongholds in your life, some of the challenges in front of you, you look at the situation and you think, how, how, what, what am I going to do here? I had a conversation with somebody last night, a situation going down in our church right now, some people, messy situations. I don't know if you ever have messy situations here with people. We find it happens sometimes. You get people involved, complicated, messy situations. And as we're talking about this, like, what are we going to do? I don't know. I got no answer. Every idea I have is problematic. And I, I don't know what to do. And we concluded together, you know what we need here? We need God. God has got to show up here and fix this, or it's just going to go badly. And it's true of so many situations in our lives. When you look at your marriage, when you look at your parenting, when you look at, at the, the challenges that are set before us and the attacks of the enemy, how are we going to do this? There's some things that only God can do. The question is, do you believe that? Do you understand that? Do you recognize that? The evidence that you believe that is in your commitment to prayer. Like if you, right, when we start praying like it depends on God, it's reflective of the fact that we get that it depends on God. But so often we are so slow and so reluctant, aren't we, to pray? And it's as if we're saying, you know what, God, I've got this. I'm, I'm good. I'm good. I've got this. Well, of course, it's, it sounds, when you say it like that, it sounds crazy, right? Why do we do it, though? Standing strong requires prayer. There are some things that will only happen in answer to prayer. If we want to see souls saved, churches planted, churches strengthened, if we're going to keep on keeping on, if we're going to make our lives count for God, it requires us to pray. To pray. That's why, again, I'm so blessed by this theme that you've chosen for this weekend, to be very intentional about giving, in uh, giving attention to that which is necessary for us to stand strong in prayer. Standing strong requires prayer. Now, the call here is to pray. That's sort of the, the main idea, the main emphasis. But Paul describes this praying. There's a, a quality of praying uh, that is described here. In fact, prayer is spoken of in many different ways. And uh, I've identified that, that uh, uh, Paul here... Uh, this, this kind of prayer that he calls for is described here. It's marked by six different things. So, so standing strong requires prayer, but there's, there's six modifiers to this that I think help us to understand the kind of praying, or the, the, there's a, a quality of praying 
that is laid out for us here in Ephesians 6. I've identified six things. So the first one is this. Standing strong requires prayer at all times. So standing strong requires prayer. That's the main thing. If you forget everything else I'm going to say tonight, you got the main point already. But unpacking that, prayer at all times. At all times. You see that at the beginning of verse 18? Praying at all times. You see how hard I had to work to figure out how to say that? In it, right? It's just, it's just right there. At all times. At all times. Constantly. Frequently. In every occasion. In all circumstances. You've heard the uh, First Thessalonians 5 and 17 probably where Paul says pray without ceasing. I think it's the same idea. A parallel idea. Praying at all times. Not just sometimes. Not just here and there. Not just at meal times. Not just at decision times. Although all those times are fantastic times to pray. I find, though, the challenge that I, I meet, and I might be the only one here who wrestles with this, so you can pray for me. I find that with this whole thing about praying at all times, I look at the pattern in my life and I say, well, I see that I pray sometimes. I maybe pray many times, but at all times? At all times. Morning, noon, and night, at meal times, yes, at, de at decision time, at meeting time, at arriving at home time, at all these times. To be seeking God in prayer turning to him, depending on him. Standing strong requires prayer at all times. Second, standing strong requires prayer of all kinds. At all times and of all kinds. He says, praying at all times in the spirit with all prayer and supplication. The supplication doesn't, it's not supper, not like dinner, but like asking for things, requesting for things, like all, all different types of praying. And that can be uh, 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 prayers. Maybe you pray in private, pray in public, pray alone, pray with others, pray out loud, pray silently in your head, pray on your knees, pray at the wheel of your car, pray with your head bowed, your eyes lifted up to the ceiling, pray for a long time, pray for a short time, pray prayers of devotion, pray prayers of desperation, prayers of all different kinds. And, and lots of you in your lives, you could testify to all different kinds of praise that, prayers that you pray in your life. So keep on praying those all the time of all different kinds. We, we look at the life of Jesus. You know, we saw last night where Jesus, it seems, would very intentionally spend meaningful material time in the presence of the Father. And then there's other times when we, we hear him, we see him cry out maybe brief prayers or there's, there's long prayers that you might pray at certain times in your life, but then there's the prayer you pray when your car is sliding backwards down an icy hill, right? Lord, I thank you for this day. and for You're probably not going there, right, when you're heading into the ditch. All different kinds of prayer, do you see? At all times, of all kinds. So what standing strong requires. It isn't the variety that's important, it's the activity of doing it, you see? It's not just one thing. Sometimes people feel like if I haven't prayed in a certain way or for a certain length of time, I haven't prayed. I still see that in Scripture. It is good and right for us to have good lengthy times of prayer, for sure. But it's good and right for us to have brief prayers as well. You see, pray, loved ones, pray. That's the exhortation. Lord, that we would stand strong. Standing strong requires prayer at all times. It requires prayer of all kinds. Third, Standing strong requires prayer that is spirit-led. Spirit-led. See that again in verse 18. Praying at all times in the spirit. You see that phrase? In the spirit. What, what does that mean? In the spirit. It means, I believe it means prayer that is empowered by, led by, informed by the Holy Spirit of God. And I think the primary tool that the Spirit uses to empower, to lead, to form our prayers is the sword of the Spirit, the Word of God, Scripture. We see that in the text, right? Taking the, the sword of the Spirit. We, we read about that in verse, uh, where did we see that? Then verse 17, the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. And then we're told in verse 18 to pray at all times in the Spirit. It's when the Spirit of God is informing, shaping, fueling my prayers, leading me in prayer, and the primary tool that he uses to do that, I believe, is Scripture, is God's Word, the truth of God's Word. And of course, 
as we're reading God's word, that's when we're hearing from God. And then in prayer, we're responding to him. It's communion. It's, it's fellowship. I love how Daniel Henderson uh, describes it. He, he encourages believers to, to have scripture-fed, spirit-led, worship-based prayer. In other words, what he means, he means, so, so scripture-fed in God's word, Spirit led, led by the Spirit of God. Remember we talked this morning about praying God's priorities? That's what we're talking about, right? Here's what God says to me. Now I'm praying in response to what I've read in his word. And it's worship-based prayer, starting with God and looking to him, to him and his priorities as the fuel that, that, or the fan that fans the flame of the fire of our prayers. John Piper said this. He said, where minds are not brimming with scripture, the heart is seldom brimming with prayer. One of the great prayer warriors in church history, and there are many, is, uh, is George Mueller. And uh, George Mueller, of course, great, great man of God, and all the work he did with, with orphans uh, many generations ago. He said this about prayer. I think this is very interesting. I think it's going to be on the screen there for us uh, that you can read along with me. See, see if you can identify with what Mueller says here in the early part of this quote. He says, Often, after having suffered much from wandering of mind for the first ten minutes, or quarter of an hour, or even half an hour, I only then really began to pray. Anybody, can anybody relate to that, that wandering of mind? Right? Now, here's a great, great prayer warrior, George Mueller. Isn't, this, isn't it kind of like misery? They say misery loves company. Isn't it kind of nice? Like, okay, I'm, I'm not the only one. After, however, what's remarkable to me is it's not just suffering from wandering a mind for a short period of time. He would keep at it and keep at it and press on. Nonetheless, he says, but I scarcely ever suffer now in this way. Well, why? What happened? What did he discover? What changed? Notice what he says. Now I saw that the most important thing I had to do was to give myself to the reading of the Word of God and to meditate on it or to think over it, that thus my heart might be comforted, encouraged, warned, reproved, instructed, and that thus, while meditating or thinking over, my heart might be brought into experimental communion with the Lord. The result I have found to be almost invariably this, that after a very few minutes, my soul has been led to confession, thanksgiving, intercession or supplications not necessarily all those maybe one of those or two of those but you see he's like i get into god's word and then i find now i'm responding to god's word he goes on so that though i so that though i did not it is it uh, as it were give myself to prayer but to meditation yet it turned almost immediately more or less into prayer you see what's happening it's sort of like it's like when you got to get that pump going you got to prime the pump first and then I'm going to get going. Before you go start that lawnmower, right? You got prime, get, the, get the fuel in there. And, okay, now it will start. And I, I think what we're being shown here is some wisdom, firstly from the Apostle Paul, but also here through, through someone like George Mueller, pointing us to something, that uh, the role and the power of the Word of God to fuel our prayer lives together. I think that's what Paul is talking about, about praying in the Spirit Meditating on the truth of God's word, being led by the Spirit, shaped by the Spirit in our praying. The Spirit of God stirs us with the truths of God that lead us to talk to God. So we're communing with Him and praying in the Spirit. I say, now, Ross, okay, you just said a whole lot of stuff there. So what are you really saying? What I'm encouraging you, loved ones, is to combine your praying with Bible. Combine your praying with Bible. Think of it as a conversation. As you're doing your God time, think of it as a conversation that you are having with Almighty God. He speaks to me, and I respond to him. Really like we did tonight, as Charles led us in the prayer. The brother came up, and he read Psalm 116. And then in responding to what we've read there, Charles just said, okay, we've, our brother just read Psalm 116. Now let's respond back to God something of what we've seen here and maybe there'll be maybe you'll read a whole chapter of scripture but there's a verse or a phrase in there that the lord is really impressed in your heart you're going to respond to him maybe a note of praise something about god that is praiseworthy god i praise you i praise you that you listen to me you listen to me what an awesome thing and then and maybe a reminder about a need yes i have a huge need lord and you know it 
give me this day my daily bread. It's communing with God in, in that way. Prayer that is spirit-led. I say standing strong requires prayer that is spirit-led because we, we, we are so dependent on God to be able to do this. And I find that, listen, there are times when prayer, prayer time can be, can, it is a struggle. But God's grace comes to us in these special ways through his word to encourage us and help us to pray. So standing strong requires prayer at all times, prayer of all kinds, prayer that is spirit-led. Fourth, it requires prayer that is attentive and alert. I see that again in verse 18. He says, praying at all times in the spirit with all prayer to that end, keep alert. To be alert, as we know what it is to be alert, it's to be awake, right? Look alive, alert. My eyes are open, I'm awake. Sometimes the idea is of, of watchfulness. Uh, the word here is used of watchfulness of the Lord's return, like not lapsing into sinful behavior, knowing that the master is due any time. It's an awakeness. It's a it's my, I, my head and my heart are engaged in this because I know I need it. It's like a, you know, one pastor put it this way, that we often we need to think of prayer more as a prayer time walkie-talkie, or as a wartime walkie-talkie, I should say, prayer time, wartime walkie-talkie, that in the midst of the battle that we are we're calling back to headquarters for resources, for strength. In the midst of battle, we're not sleeping, we're not snoozing. Well, the, the battle is raging around us. And the call is for us to be attentive and not sleepy. Mark 14 and 38, on the night Jesus was arrested, he went out to Gethsemane and to pray. And he said to his disciples, watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. Keep awake. Keep awake. First Peter 5, 8, Peter says, be sober-minded. Be sober-minded. Well, what does that mean to be sober-minded? Well, what would it mean to be not sober-minded? Drunk-minded? Kind of dopey-minded, kind of just under another influence. No, but be sober-minded. So awake, my, my mind is in tune. Watchful, he says. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. You know, like if you knew there was a lion nearby. I haven't had too many close encounters with lions in my life. In fact, I don't think I've had any that I know of. But if you knew there was one prowling around nearby, you'd be alert and awake to it. Well, loved ones, there is a lion prowling around. And we're called to being alert. Colossians 4, 2, continue steadfastly in prayer, being watchful in it. Recognizing the battle we're in, recognizing the urgency of our need, the necessity of putting on this armor and now communicating with God. This is what we're called to. This is just so important for us to stand strong, to be watchful in it. It's one of the many reasons it's so important to pray together because we can encourage each other in this and pray for one another and remind each other, even by example, of the importance of being watchful and attentive. Standing strong requires prayer that is attentive. Fifth, standing strong requires prayer that perseveres. Prayer that perseveres. Back in our text, verse 18, praying at all times in the Spirit, with all prayer and supplication to that end keep alert with all there it is perseverance it's a steadfastness it's a being given over to something a, a, a zealousness a, a devotion think of the athlete training him or herself for the olympics right they're they're all in on this it's not just sort of a weekend workout routine it's not sort of a, a two-week boot camp but it's a it's a lifestyle a commitment to keeping on, keeping on, from diet to exercise to training to sleep. It's, this, it's a, I just keep on this all the time and I don't stop. It's the notion of a, not a sprint, but a marathon. To keep on, keeping on. Standing strong requires prayer that keeps on, that perseveres. Mueller said this, he said, the fault of the children of God is that they do not continue in prayer. They do not go on praying. They do not persevere. If they desire anything for God's glory, they should pray until they get it. So keep on praying. You say, okay, now, Pastor, now, you, now, now you've made me angry, okay? Because I have prayed, and I have been praying. But God is not answering. So what do you got for me now? What do you got to say about that? 
Well, my easy answer is I don't know. But I do have some other things I'd say. When it comes to unanswered prayer, sometimes we, do, we don't get answers because what we want is God's gifts and not so much God. James 4 and 3 James says, you ask and do not receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your passions. You know, sometimes, sometimes what we encounter is a God who loves us too much to give us what we ask for at times. Maybe there's something you are pleading with God, but you realize, you know, I have come to almost treat that thing as so important that I have to have that or I won't be happy. But of course, we know that that's not reality. We know we're fooling ourselves. We know no, my real ultimate only happiness is, is in God. And sometimes the Lord may, maybe even, it may seem like a strange kindness, but in kindness withhold something because he's got something better for us. Sometimes we want God's gifts, but not God. Sometimes we don't get answers because we will not repent of sin. We will not repent of sin. I'm reminded of 1 Peter 3 and 7 where husbands are cautioned about how they treat their wives for the sake of their prayers. It's almost like you want your prayers answered, buddy. And how's it going at home? And your attitude toward this woman who I've given you. Of course, it's not just husbands toward wives, men and women in our lives. There are times in which the Lord will, will not be opening his hand because we are living in sin and unrepentant. And yes, he may indeed be willing and glad to respond to that prayer request and to move in this particular way, but there is another bigger pressing issue here. It's your heart and your, your mouth and your mind. Sometimes we'll not repent of sin. Loved one, I would plead with you to repent. First of all, there's much safety in repentance, but also much grace, much grace from God when we would humble ourselves before him. Sometimes, too, we ask for things that aren't actually good for us. 1 John 5, 14 and 15 says, And this is the confidence that we have toward him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. So his inclination is to give, to provide, but sometimes there's, there's times that we ask for things that we think is this, this is what we need. This is what I need right now, but actually God knows better. It's not, it's not good for us. It reminds me of a pastor telling a story one time about his son wanting a cracker for a snack. And climb up, and Daddy, I want a cracker, I want a cracker. I'm pointing at the crackers, I want the crackers. So he gets the crackers out, and opens up, and the crackers have gone all moldy inside. And so father, the father says, oh, you know, no, you, know you, can't, you can't have these. Well, why? I want the cracker. But no, well, these aren't good. I want the cracker. Now, you're not fair, not nice, Daddy, not nice. Well, of course, it's not, it's not good for you. It's not good for you. And sometimes, if we're honest, we're like that child, right? We're so sure. Because we know everything. But actually, God knows better. Sometimes, sometimes the Lord knows it's not actually good for you. Something else, too, about sometimes we don't get answers because we don't pray in faith. What I mean by that is we take the attitude that, well, I can't hurt. No, no, listen, we're called to believe in the Lord and to trust him and ask, believing that he's there and that he cares, that he hears us. So there, there's lots of things we could say about why we don't get answers, these, the, the answers that we're looking for. But you know, the, the, the biggest challenge we have when it comes to unanswered prayer is this, that we, we don't ask. We don't ask. Ask and you will receive, Jesus says. James says, you have not because you ask not. And so, loved ones, the encouragement, the call from Paul here is, listen, standing strong in prayer requires perseverance that we keep on seeking the Lord in prayer. And wonderfully, God helps us in this. He encourages us in this. And even uses the means of like a, a message like tonight to remind us of these things, things you probably already even already know. But to hear it, the Spirit of God uses to encourage us to keep going. Keep going. Don't stop praying. Don't stop knocking. Keep after it. Standing strong requires prayer at all times, of all kinds, that's spirit-led, that's attentive, that perseveres, sixth and final. Standing strong requires prayer for one another. Prayer for one another. Again, looking at verse 18, praying at all times in the spirit with all prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert with all perseverance 
Notice, making supplication for all the saints. And Paul puts himself in there in verse 19, doesn't he? Do you see that? And also, notice, notice, also for me. Pray for me too, that words may be given to me. In opening my mouth, he's like, I need, I need your help. I need you to pray for me in, in my ministry. That God would help me to, to speak the truth, to declare the gospel, but boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel for which I'm an ambassador in chains, that I may declare it boldly as I ought to speak. It's making requests, asking for things for one another. Just wonder if that is, I wonder if that, is that a, a meaningful, significant part of your prayer commitment, praying for one another? I suspect that for many of you it is. And the, the, the importance of loving one another by praying for one another. And also, too, bearing with one another by praying for one another. I've been convicted many times that I don't have the right to get frustrated with people for whom I'm not praying. I don't have much of a right to get frustrated with people that I'm not praying for. So maybe you can put that in your, okay, I'll, you got some people that frustrate you. I'll maybe get you and start praying for them. And just see, maybe, maybe you see how God works in a powerful way. But to pray for one another, to love one another, encourage one another. Listen to what Jesus said. He said this to Peter. He said, Simon, Simon, Luke 22, verses 31 and 32. Simon, Simon, behold, Satan demanded to have you that he might sift you like wheat. But I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail. And when you have turned again, strengthen your brothers. What a powerful text. Like, don't take this for granted. Take seriously here what Jesus is saying. The devil has asked it, has asked, he has wanted, he's desired to sift you, like to test your faith. To take you like, like, like he did Job in the Old Testament and shake you. And to see what you're made of. To making a bet with the Almighty that you'll, you'll curse God and die. He is, he is demanded to have you. But what did Jesus say? He said, but I have prayed for you. I prayed for you that your faith may not fail. Now again, don't, don't, don't breeze over this. How did Peter do? There was a rough patch there, wasn't there? There was the denial on the biggest night in human history. Peter blew it. But he got a second chance, didn't he? And by God's grace, did he ever make good on, the unset, on that second chance? To love the Lord and to live for the Lord. The great foundational apostolic ministry and what we have in the New Testament, in the book of Acts and 1 Peter and 2 Peter. What an amazing story we have. Example in, this, in our brother, in the apostle Peter. How did he make it? How did he not wash out under that spiritual battle? Well, apparently, according to Jesus, because he prayed for him. But I have prayed for you. But I prayed for you. Loved ones, do not underestimate the power of a praying brother or sister in the lives of one another. This is how we will make it. This is how we'll press on. This is how we'll be fruitful. This is how we'll stay faithful. It's a means that is given to the church, to given to you and I by God, that we would pray for one another. Why? Because we need it. What a privilege that we have. What an opportunity we have as well. Let me show you one other text, and then I'll bring things to a close. Excuse me. <coughs> Romans chapter 15 and First Romans 15 is, I mean, I mean, it's, it's a remarkable book, the whole book of Romans, but in some ways, actually, when, by the time you get to the end, you realize it, it kind of reads like a missionary letter. And in Romans 15, Paul gets to talking about his plans and what he's endeavoring to do on mission for the Lord. And in verse 24, he says something very interesting that's relevant to our topic here tonight. He says, to the Roman believers, he says, I hope to see you in passing as I go to Spain and be helped on my journey there by you. He goes on to say, I appeal to you, brothers, by our Lord Jesus Christ and by the love of the Spirit to strive together with me in your prayers to God on my behalf that I may be delivered from the unbelievers in Judea 
and that my service for Jerusalem may be acceptable to the saints, so that by God's will I may come to you with joy and be refreshed in your company. Now, you can, okay, Ross, where, where are you going with this? All right, here's where I'm going with this. His ambition is that he wants to go to Spain. And he's going to go to Spain by way of Rome. And his appeal to the Roman believers is to strive together with me in your prayers to God. Now, the Apostle Paul had a fruitful ministry indeed, didn't he? Did he make it to Spain? We don't think so. We don't think so. I mean, we don't know for sure, for sure, but we don't think so. Question. Did the Roman believers pray for him? You can say, well, Ross, we don't know, and I, I don't know either. I don't know either. Perhaps they did. And in God's providence, he had a different plan for Paul, and things went just exactly as God had desired and delighted, as it always does. He's a sovereign God. Perhaps they did pray. Perhaps they didn't pray. He didn't make it. Hey, we kind of don't know. But what I want to do is to remind you about this call here about praying for one another. And that it is, it is not something to be taken for granted. It's not something to say, oh, it's kind of optional. No, it's vital and God answers prayer. And it's a great mystery how we combine together the sovereignty of God and the reality of praying and answered prayers. But we see in Scripture... There's a priority here for praying for one another. And this is how we're going to make it. Here's the point, loved ones. Without prayer, we're dead. So be strong in the Lord by praying for one another. And I'll tell you, I have experienced this so many times again and again in my life. And many of you can say the same. I think of a particular season in my life. It wasn't all that long ago where I was in a just, just in a kind of one of those, those seasons that maybe you've experienced where it's just a, a heavy darkness. And uh, the, 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 the spiritual battle is real. It's hard to really even put your finger on what it is and what you're feeling, what you're experiencing. But the challenge is real. The pressures were many. And deeply struggling, struggling in my faith and my confidence in the Lord. And um, uh, things were dark and struggling, but I'm still having to sort of press on and put on the brave face. And I remember one day showing up at church, and then and, uh, one of the senior saints in our church at the time, we, she was just in front of me, and she saw me, and she was, I think she was just sort of walking the other way. She stopped, and she turned around, and she came back to me and looked at me and said, Ross, are you okay? And I said, I gave the good Christian answer. Oh, yeah, I'm fine. I'm doing good. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for asking. And then she kept looking at me, and I was like, what? why are you asking me this? She said, well, the reason is because I woke in the night last night, and I was immediately impressed on my heart that I need to pray for you. And so I did. Three in the morning, I got up, and I just knew I was just overcome by this sense I need to pray for you. So I prayed for you. She prayed for my faith. She prayed for my perseverance. She prayed, I don't know what else she prayed for. She said, I prayed for you. So that's why I was wondering. I called her by name. I said, well, Sue, uh, the truth is that I am not doing well. And I can't thank you enough for praying for me. And listen, in the grand scheme of things, the Lord was doing lots of things in my life. But it was a pivotal day. And that, and that part of the journey, a pivotal day of God being gracious to me and helping me. Now listen, imagine you being my friend Sue and what joy there is in being able to, to serve one another that way. I can tell you the blessing it was to me as well. There's many Sundays when I just have to, I'm just, just pulling myself up into the pulpit to preach. But I am certain that I'm able to do many of the things I'm able to do because people are praying. And that's the same for you as well, brothers and sisters. So... Standing strong requires prayer. Prayer at all times, of all kinds, that's spirit-led, that's attentive, that perseveres, that is for one another. So I just want to leave you with this challenge. I want to encourage you. Uh, I wrote down uh, four things here, four specific things. I'll give them to you in rapid succession, and then we'll close in prayer. One, I would challenge you, if you are married, to pray with your spouse. Pray with your spouse. Now, some of you hear that, and you're like, that is weird. I don't, and, then, and here's the real thing. For some spouses, it's a, it's a thing. 
where it's difficult to do. And I don't know, I understand, I don't know why that is, but here's, here is my personal challenge to you. It's, made a, it's, it's meaningful to my wife and I. I would challenge you, if you are married to someone, then I would challenge you to every day, even just before you go to sleep at night, every night before you go to sleep, to pray. Husband, I want to encourage you, I want to challenge you, reach out, grab your wife's hand, and pray. If she says, you're only doing it because the preacher said to do it, you say, the preacher's right. And to pray. You say, well, I, what, what, what am I going to pray? It doesn't need to be a long prayer. You could say the Lord's Prayer. Father in heaven, hallowed be your name in our marriage. You could stop right there. Or your kingdom come in our daughter's life. Your will be done in this decision we're trying to make. Maybe you just thank the Lord. Lord, thank you that, thank you that we're here under this roof tonight together. Thank you for your provision today. Maybe there's a particular opportunity in front of you you want to just pray for. My wife and I, Leanne, we pray together almost every night. And uh, listen, it's, it's not some spectacular, like there's, like there's not you know, lights and firework and smoke or anything like that. Like we just pray. It's about a one-minute prayer. Sometimes it's two minutes. Sometimes maybe it's longer. But sometimes it's even shorter. But we'll pray every night. I want to challenge you to do this. It's Because the Bible says pray at all times. It's what a great discipline. What a blessing. You won't, you will not regret that to pray together. You say, that sounds weird. That sounds hard. Just try it. Just do it. You say, okay, well, what if my spouse is not a believer? Well, then maybe you just take that opportunity to pray. And, and may, maybe you pray out loud. Or maybe you pray quietly. But to pray, take that opportunity at the end of the day to pray. Second thing I wrote down is this, and this, again, this will sound a little weird, but pray at meals. You say, well, I we got that checked off. That's awesome. Love it. Love it. But I would just add to that, pray intentionally at meals. If, if you're like lots of households, and I've, I've been in this by, myself, sometimes you, in the good thing of praying at meals, that prayer at meal can become kind of rote. Like it's kind of the same thing. It's kind of a script you got down pretty good. And that's, that's, I don't think there's anything wrong with that as long as you're sincere. But maybe it just challenged you a little bit to pray, be very intentional about taking that meal time to pray something really specific or a current need, to change it up a bit. You might even get a look as you pray that prayer at your meals. But, but use that meal time. Yet we eat, I eat about three times a day. I'm not sure how often you eat, but three times. We've got some opportunity in there to be disciplined about praying. Pray with your spouse, pray at meals. Commit to prayer and praise. There you go, Pastor Colin, you're welcome. High five. Commit to prayer and praise. This is a vital, vi I, have, I honestly have no idea how well attended your prayer meetings are. I honestly have no idea. I didn't ask. I'm not asking now, but I'm just saying, if your church is meeting to pray, then do what you can to be here to pray. It's meaningful. It's important. Finally, pray about praying. Pray about praying. And that I'm going to help you do right now. Let's pray. Father in heaven, the reality is, as we talk about prayer, we know and we feel that it's a battleground. We see that we need to do it. And yet the struggle is, it's so strong. Thank you for your great grace toward us. Thank you for the powerful working of your spirit who moves in us to do things that we don't naturally desire to do. That you help us, Lord, at the level of our wants to do that which is good for us and necessary. So, Lord, I pray about praying. I pray right in this moment now that you would increase faith, encourage my brothers and sisters, Lord. Help us to be men and women who are frequently in your presence, thanking you, praising you, pleading with you, asking of you, grieving in your presence, pouring out our hearts before you, Lord. Lord, I pray that in this season in our lives, Lord, that there would be a sweetened, deepened communion with you. I pray for prayer meetings here in this local church, Lord, that they would be vibrant and alive, Lord. Vibrant and alive because there's faith in the room and sincere seeking of you, Lord God. I pray that this would be an unusual season, a season of unusual, mighty working of your spirit in us and through us, Lord. That we would see lives changed, Lord, souls saved, Lord. Thank you for the evidence, the many evidences of your grace that I'm seeing here this weekend, Lord. Thank you so much for your mighty working, Lord. Here, but baptism's coming and 
and people growing in their faith and coming to faith and uh, uniting together and caring for one another and serving together. Lord, I pray for more of that, that you would fan into flame our affections for you and for one another, and that our praying, Lord, would be fruitful and effective and fervent, oh God, I pray. And Lord, that you'd make us strong as a result. Lord Jesus, we need you. We, de- we can do nothing apart from you. So we commit this to you, this issue of prayer, personally and corporately to you in Jesus' name.